my name is Simpia. I want to talk to you. Ah, I want to talk to you. I want to have an idea that is bankable. You want that idea to be funded. One, two. I want to develop an app for you. Yeah? I want to develop it. I want to be innovative. I want to be a digital age. I want to be a developer of an app. I want to be a developer. Um... Yeah, in terms of the process, as I said, my name is Simpio from a company called Empower Works Events and Comms. Um, I'm the you know, chief uh, protege, myself and Theo Mashiko. Uh, we are the only one that receives the wisdom of Babu Morris, and then the rest, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, that's why I think I know, no, no, Theo, Yeti, Ama. You know, multi-level marketing. La oba figure gala, you oba succeed ayo. Manje nati it is figure gala la, and we you know, all the wisdom we gala get, and then we vet it, and then we distribute it according to you know to other proteges. Um, Bob Morris has, is very passionate about us, particular black emerging entrepreneurs. Aus Polo, um, you know, he's he, he has started this organization called Unleashing Leadership Potential. It's ULP, as I said, it stands for Unleashing Leadership Potential. We have hosted a number of leading CEOs, including your Putuman Tleko, Jabu Mabuza, uh, Brian, um, uh, Brian, can I say name Tate Brian Gama? Brian Tate Brian Malefe, Tate David Malapo, a lot of other leading entrepreneurs that came to speak. And today we are honored. This is the first session for the year. You know, to have a dynamic, a charismatic, uh, you know, an inspirational, you know, seasoned entrepreneur, Aus Polo, just to come and talk to us. I know some of you, Lemubona Go TV, um, you know, when, uh, when, when she was part of the, you know, the Dragon's Den. But today she's here to talk to us and to challenge us and to inspire us as, uh, as young people. You know, when I, when I was posing a question to, you know, to ask, it truly reminds me of, you know, of a friend of mine, you know, uh, the other day, you know, we're having a chat, I'm having a chat tonight, and he's complaining about his daughter, and he said, that's my sister, you know, like, like, uh, like Otanda Mali, you know, like malicious men and that those about Otanda, you know, le, you know, le Mali, uh, you know, we call them that they are, they are malicious. Um, and today I know that most of us is funny mad, I think. Um, and strange enough, I've realized that companies have a lot of funds or money to fund entrepreneurs, but they can't locate us. And I, and I hope after this conversation and presentation, we can begin to network and direct us you know, to various opportunities. Um, as I said, I'm not going to waste much of your time. I'll, in terms of the process, I'll introduce the chair, uh, who's our mentor, uh, who's our coach, and our sounding board, Obabu Morris. Most of us, we know him. He's a you know, vice president of NHG at Sasol. Um, he was one of the founders of Excel. Some of you know Excel. Uh, before it became Sasol Oil, he's also the chair of Sasol Oil. He's a founder of Unleashing Leadership Potential. Um, and in Dawiak, Guakela, and Metsi Behavior. Morris, okay. But during the week, if you want to use this place, you can do that. Uh, if you're getting married on Sunday or Saturday, I know that other people are getting married on Thursday and Friday. You can use this venue. There's a full package. Um, you know, if you don't have a phone, they say, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> it's like, shut this. Uh, if you don't have an MC, Theo is, is there. He will MC your wedding, but we have a full package. You know, um, if you want to do activations, you want to have a strategy session or a board meeting, we have... Um, you know, rooms that size, uh, that site that, uh, you know, are fit for that purpose. 
and make sure that uh, if you want to use this venue, you talk to Theo or Nassim. Is Nassim here? Uh, and Nassim, she's outside. Uh, make sure that you talk to Nassim. You know, if you want to use this venue for any activ uh, activation or activity, make sure that you you know you talk to her. If you need the DVDs of previous speakers that we had, as I was saying, we had Putu Mantleko, we had Lazaro Zim, we had Dr. David Mlapo, we had um, Umamu Ubus Mabuza IDC. We had, I think we had close to you know, 40 to 50 speakers that came and challenged us. The DVDs are outside, they're reasonable. We take all cards, credit cards, debit card, sasa card. Now, if we pet her, it's a swipe. As I tell her now, it's a long time into it, but I'm kidding. But we take all cards, you know, outside. Make sure that you buy as many as you can. Are we all together? Without waste of, uh, without wasting much time, let me introduce you to, you to our chair, Obabo Morris. He will then introduce the speaker. I will come, and then I will take the Q&A, and then I will call the chair to do the vote of thanks. And then that's it. Let's give the chair a round of applause. That's my love. Have you got the? OK, all right. This is the beginning of the new year. Last week, we postponed it because there was a sauna, uh, State of the Nation address by our president. And uh, uh, so I understand some of you came here on Thursday. Uh, sorry if you did. We tried our best to communicate. Uh, it was one of those saunas that uh, I was sitting there on tender hooks, thinking that it's going to be another big drama and the and, uh, and, uh, point of order and point of exigency. <laughs> And it was very peaceful, and uh, it was great speech. And, uh, and I think because we are part of a, a nation building and part of the continent's dream of 2063, and most of you will still be around at that time, uh, of making a, a, a united, peaceful, and prosperous Africa, and also a part of making sure that we're making our nation uh, successful. So we knew we usually start by standing up and praying for our nation and singing our national anthem. Why don't we do that? And it's on the screen. All right, go. Thank you, thank you very much. Welcome, please come, 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 come in. Uh, the seats in front here. I think we must start getting ushers to go, bring people to come and sit in front. 
let me thank particularly uh, Africa, West Africa and the Kono guys uh, for helping us and inviting uh, Sispulu. And it's very great to have you. Uh, acknowledge all the people that are here and, and say all protocol is observed. The only protocol I'm not going to overlook is my wife. Amen. <laughs> I see, I want to say, I'm feeling like I'm preaching now. <laughs> and uh, she's here, we acknowledge her. Uh, it's uh, simply, this is not my place. Uh, it is Joyce's place. Uh, and she's the one who controls what happened here. Genesis Prenda, Genesis Prenda, Zilanga Pambil. Now I'm fitting them fish on the land. We, we've got spaces uh, for, 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 for all the people, the leadership. All right, this is the first 2019. It's great. Let me also wish you a happy 2019 and all the blessings and every wish that you have. If you really wanted to succeed, whatever dream that you have, I'm sure you're going to get it. Uh, do you believe that? Yeah, this is great. Uh, it is good to be here. And so, uh, we've got a great speaker today, an entrepreneur par excellence, and it is really great. I'm seeing, the, the reason I'm just holding on is there's a lot of people, they're just arriving here. Uh, and uh, it's great to have, uh, as I was speaking to her, uh, I was saying it's great to have uh, Young, at my age now, I can call people young. <laughs> Talented. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to know Lucy, I'm a Lucy. Win me, win me, win me. All right, okay, everyone is settled. See, there's a gentleman there with a nice tie coming. All right, I think we're going to start now. Let me introduce to you uh, Upolo Lidega. She's an executive director and founder of IDF Capital, managing partner and co-founder of Alithia, IDF Managers. What is she passionate about? She's an entrepreneur, passionate about entrepreneurship. Uh, she's been part of the co-creators of the uh, B Codes of Good Conduct while she spent her time at DTI. So she's done her national duties, serving our government. Uh, she's the through what she's doing through the IDF Capital is to really focus on contributing and channeling investment, particularly to women-owned business. And that's wonderful, man. Let's give a round of applause for that. <laughs> I've always challenged women here that this is a season for women. If you miss the season, when the season of uh, women empowerment was happening. <laughs> Were you sleeping through the revolution? You know? Uh, if you don't take, I also acknowledge, uh, hey, there's Patrick Wadula, uh, our seasoned uh, uh, journalist around town, and he's helping us here. So women-owned businesses, that's great. Uh, uh, wonderful work that you're doing, and it's very important. But not only here, across the whole sub-Saharan Africa, focusing on women. And, uh, and obviously, you all know her from the Dragon's Den show. And is a co-author. She's authoring books, which is great. And uh, we're really very proud to have you. And uh, I've asked her to speak from her heart. She said she prepared a presentation, but she likes to speak to you. Uh, so we're going to have the same story. She's going to tell a story, and then from there, prepare your questions, and then we'll take a lot of questions and engagement. That's what we really like uh, to have. So without any waste of time, Mrs. Pulu, please come up front.
Dimela and Bumeli went at Haven. Given over to my Kibatiba. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Ndate Khadebe, for having me. Uh, I was explaining to him that uh, actually my official surname is Khadebe, so there's some nepotism in the selection process of the speaker today. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me this evening. I really look forward to engaging with the people that are here today. I'm told that uh, the room is full mainly of professionals, so it's not entrepreneurs per se, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it a combination of entrepreneurs it's and professionals? Entrepreneurs, okay. Everyone. So I've been both, or all of those, so I can talk to them. Yeah. So, um, I really am honored, uh, after looking at the people that have spoken here, I, I was wondering how Africa figured that I fitted the bill of the quality of people. So I'm really honored, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I receive whatever message it is that you are, you are sending my way by, by, by choosing me to come here today. So I will share with you my story and I'm hoping that because our stories are very similar, I've come to appreciate uh, our stories are not as unique as we like them to, to uh, as we would like to think they are. But a lot of the time, I find that you sometimes need to hear another person's story, and hear your story in their story, and find expression uh, about yourself in their story. So I'm hoping today we can uh, do that. Um, I have a very interesting background. I was uh, born in Lesotho, uh, but I grew up uh, all my life in. Uh, a place called Bukutazwana, a mafi gang. Uh, so I am a Mosoto, but uh, I, I, I relate a lot to Botswana as well. But it meant that I grew up as a foreigner. Uh, they, they used to call me my Nyeo, because, <laughs> because uh, my mother spoke very deep to Soto, so that's what they used to call us. Um, uh, but it was an interesting uh, 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 upbringing, because we, as I said, we were sort of foreigners, uh, and therefore different. Uh, and a lot of the time uh, probably were teased. And, and I think that's, that, that I have found uh, makes you a very resilient person in life because you're always uh, defending yourself and justifying your existence uh, uh, throughout life. Uh, but it wasn't a bad childhood, it wasn't a bad experience at all. It was just that it was a little bit different to that of very many people uh, uh, around us. Um, I grew up uh, there, went to school there, and then of course went to university uh, in, in Cape Town where I did my BCom degree. Uh, in those days, uh, most black parents did not have money. They could not afford to pay uh, their kids' school fees. So every year at UWC, we used to doi doi for financial uh, exclusion. I don't know whether people experienced this in those days. Every year, you are guaranteed that you'll be excluded from school, whether it was uh, academic exclusions or financial exclusions. In my case, it was always financial exclusions. So I would get onto the bus um, uh, every January, and I know that for two weeks we are toy toying, and the police get called to campus, and then the university makes arrangements with Standard Bank to give us student loans, and then we register three weeks later, and, and that's how I finished my degree. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so I have a lot of sympathy for the, 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 the fees must fall movement, because I honestly believe that if we were not as militant in those days as we were, uh, some of us would not be standing here today. Uh, so I'm very, very thankful that um, you know, I grew up during a time where people understood their rights, even though their rights were still limited, and fought for what they truly believed. Uh, you know, education is their right, and they, they, they truly fought for it and, uh, because they believed in it. And here we are today. And I think a lot of black South Africans can talk about a similar story where they, you know, they'll talk about the challenges that they had to go through and, the, you know, and how they made it against uh, uh, all odds. Um, but my entrepreneurial journey actually started way before I went to university. My entrepreneurial journey started uh, when um, I, used to, I used to like money when I was a kid. <laughs> And my mother was a, a typical uh, rural woman who believed that children should not be going around the township carrying money because they will get into all sorts of trouble. So we never really used to get pocket money. We never uh, got you know, we never pocket money. So I found ways of making money by selling stuff. I sold sweets, I sold um, chips, uh, what we call chips now, in those days. 
Um, and, uh, and of course, I ate half of the stock and then sold the other half of the stock. <laughs> so I learned very quickly that uh, stealing from your business is the quickest way to bankrupt you. Because I was always a survivalist uh, 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 entrepreneur. I never grew from, you know, because you could start with chips, uh, sorry, with masimba and then the sweets and then chocolate and then maybe with move to ice guava. You know, in those days, ice guava was quite a thing. So I never quite moved beyond uh, Masimba and the Swiss because half of my stock was, was uh, going into my stomach. And that was a very important lesson in entrepreneurship, that you need to respect your business. Your business is not uh, you. You are not your business. Your business, uh, I often say in law, is actually a, big, is, is a, is a, is a person in law. And you need to respect the fact that this person in law, you cannot take from them without them giving you permission. So that was my first uh, lesson in entrepreneurship. Uh, but I was also always a very big dreamer. My mother always tells me that from a very young age, I used to say to her that I'm going to be a millionaire. Uh, I used to, I was an ardent reader uh, when I was growing up. I read everything. I don't know whether people still remember People magazine. Uh, it was quite a thing in those days. If you wanted to know anything and everything that was going on in Hollywood, that was the magazine to read. So I read that from cover to cover. I read Borna from cover to cover and any other magazine that uh, I could get my hands on. And, and that gave me a sense of how the other half lived. Because in South Africa, you didn't see a lot of black people wealthy. So in People magazine, you'd read about uh, Oprah Winfrey, uh, who was... Uh, you know, a black woman who looked like me, but was said to be a multimillionaire and saving people all over the, the continent. And I was like, geez, when I grow up, eh, eh, I want to be eh, like that. And, and for me, I think the, the importance of, of, of recognizing myself in Oprah was that it gave me permission. I was talking to Dr. Khadebe in the room now that sometimes we don't realize that by standing in front of people and telling a story, we, we give them permission to dream bigger than what their circumstances allow them. A, a, a to dream. So I used to really see myself as a, a, a millionaire because there was Oprah who looked like me and she was a multi-millionaire and I was like, if she can do it, why can't I do it, you know? And we laugh about it today, by the way, because I then set my sights on uh, being this millionaire, whatever it meant, uh, as, as, as I started my career uh, in articles, uh, to do my, my accounting and auditing articles. Um, and that's really has been my journey where um, I've, I've sort of started right, you know, right, right at the bottom, having very big dreams around uh, what I would like to achieve uh, in life and, and being very bold uh, and going out and achieving uh, those dreams. Now, this is important because I, I had a stretch session last week with my team and, uh, I'm, and I'll share with you later on. I'm in the process of making myself redundant from my business. So... The, so, so as I'm handing over the baton, they say, uh, what, uh, what are the lessons that you would like to leave us with? And I said, never ever be afraid to be bold because it is in your boldness that you achieve you know, greater, uh, greater things than anybody could have ever dreamt uh, of you achieving. Um, and I share this with you because I remember when, when uh, when I mentioned the fact that I was at the DTI, so when I left the DTI and I decided that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, uh, people would ask me, you know, why are you going to start a business that funds small businesses, that funds black women? There are, not, there are no black small businesses that are going to succeed that you, that you can fund, or there are, no, there are not sufficient black women entrepreneurs that you can invest in successfully and make money out of it. And it was because of that naysaying that I said, well, I'm going to be that girl who figures out how you're going to invest in this market successfully and still make money out of it whilst, being, while still being a socially impactful. This was 11 years ago. I was told that, uh, you know, you won't last a few years. In fact, I was given three years at most uh, to, 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 to survive. And uh, 11 years later, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how, how we rank in the market, but I'm told that we are one of the leading fund managers in, the, in, in an asset class, class and in a space that we were told there are no black entrepreneurs, there are no black women, you will not succeed. And, uh, you know, and, 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 you know I, I look at that journey and that story and 
the reason why I'm making myself redundant in my South African business is actually because I'm, I'm, I'm expanding into Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we are busy finalizing, you know, uh, getting investors on board to help us uh, start doing transactions in West Africa uh, and, and, and the rest of SADC. And again, the same story. Uh, we started this journey in 2014 and uh, we said to international investors, well, we've proven in South Africa that you can invest successfully in women-owned businesses, so we now want to take it to the rest of the continent. And we'll start with West Africa and SADC, West Africa, simply because I've got a business partner there. And then ultimately, it will, it will cover the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. It took us the first two years, so I started in 2014, it took us the first two years to convince Europeans that African women were not sitting at the corner of the street selling tomatoes and peanuts. You know, it took us more than two years to convince them that they were very dynamic uh, African women, very dynamic businesses run by African women that could absorb amounts of two million US dollars, three million US dollars, five million US dollars. It's only four years later, because it took us two years to, for them to even see the picture and then another two years for them to start working on actually putting together their investment papers. So now we are signing a, a, a agreements. It took four years to convince European men that you come to Africa, you find uh, African women who can speak English, who can add one plus one uh, to come to two, who know the difference between debit and credit, who are engineers, who are experts in their chosen fields. Uh, and those are the challenges, and that's the level of boldness that I'm talking about, that you know, the, what I've learned is that opportunity in entrepreneurship requires you to be bold. You need to be bold enough, firstly, to to recognize the challenges that we face. I always say that the challenges we face as a continent are a huge opportunity for us as entrepreneurs, by the way. I think when, when people talk about problems of Africa, look, look at them as opportunities that Africa presents. But be bold enough to be that girl or that boy who's going to find the solution to the problem, who's going to, who's going to unlock the opportunity and make a, a real entrepreneurial uh, um, success of it. Because these opportunities actually are uh, entrepreneurial opportunities for us as, uh, as Africans, as, as women uh, as well. So, so those are the, the things that uh, uh, I suppose make me wake up every morning and say, what am I going to do today? I'm going to make one more African wealthy. Because I think we have, to do, we have to do it ourselves. We have to write our own story. Our story has been written by the West for too long. Uh, and we've been waiting for them to change the narrative. It's not changing. It is uh, us, the young ones, <laughs> who have to rewrite our story and uh, change the narrative. So uh, people often ask me, so what was going on when you started, uh, you know, when you decided that you wanted to start this business? What problem were you trying to solve? And I often uh, ask this question to entrepreneurs as well. People come to us at IDF and they're looking for funding and uh, sometimes they've got great ideas, sometimes they've got nice presentations, uh, but after 30 minutes of a conversation, you, you don't understand what problem the person is trying to solve. And uh, as an entrepreneur, I can tell you now, if you are not clear in your mind what problem you're trying to solve, you will never be able to solve it. I hope that's, it, it's simple, ne? It's simple. So when you go to a funder and you say, oh, what business should I get into? That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, the question you should be asking is what problems are there to solve and which one of them can I solve? Which one of them can I galvanize resources around solving? Which one of them do I have skills uh, to solve? Which one of them am I passionate enough about to want to solve? For me, I think that is the biggest uh, ingredient of being a successful entrepreneur. And that I've also learned over the years because I've had to constantly ask myself the question, what problem am I really trying to solve? You know, and uh, once I've figured out what problem I, I'm trying to solve, I then ask the question because I'm also an accountant and I've been taught that you, you know, you must, uh, your credits must increase uh, more than your debits or the other way around. Um, well, if it's the income statement, your credits must, must be higher than your debits. Uh, so, so you then ask yourself the question, so once I have found a solution to this problem, can I exploit it successfully and make money out of it? And I often wonder how many entrepreneurs ask themselves that question. And it's a, it's, it's a challenge that, by the way, 
regardless of my many years of experience as an entrepreneur, I still struggle with. Uh, because as an entrepreneur, sometimes you feel driven by passion, because I'm very passionate about what I do. And sometimes in the process of being passionate, you forget, you forget to price, to price uh, appropriately. So, so the importance of, of asking yourself, is it, you know, and now that I've figured out what problem to solve and how to solve it, um, am I going to be able to make money out of it? And we don't spend enough time thinking about that as entrepreneurs, I find. A lot of the time when we interrogate uh, ent entrepreneurs, uh, you know, and, and when they present their, their businesses to us, and then you ask them the questions, they'll tell you, well, I'll, I'm going to sell it for 10 rand, but they don't tell you whether they're going to make a profit or a loss out of it. And that's another mistake that I think often leads to uh, our um, premature uh, failure as, as young uh, businesses, as black businesses uh, in particular. And women are the biggest culprits. Women are the worst when it comes to pricing. Women are afraid of uh, demanding their worth. I'm, I'm, again, I'm speaking from experience. You know, when we started uh, our business in 2007, 2008, we were actually pioneers in this space, by the way. Uh, when I say pioneers, they were not, other than Anglo-American that had anglo Zimele, and then you had Sasol that had, uh, no, no, who, who had Siaka? It was Barlow World. Sasol had uh, Camp City. Camp City. Uh, and a few, no, it was not Siaka, I can't remember, I think they called themselves Siakula at, at Barlow World. You actually didn't have a lot of people playing, and, and these are big corporates I'm talking about. You didn't have private entrepreneurs uh, actually setting up funds that were targeting black entrepreneurs uh, to support them in supply chains and to grow them from early stage to, 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 to mature businesses. And we were the pioneers. We went out and we were just young. I mean, I was 32 at the time, thereabout. So young African women, uh, everybody is afraid that I'm going to take their money and run away with it. And we started this thing. and. Um, and, and we, we are seen as market leaders uh, uh, in the space, but it, it was driven a lot by passion. It was driven a lot by, we know that there are entrepreneurs out there that we can invest in successfully. We know that there are women entrepreneurs that we can invest in successfully. What we forgot to do properly is to then say, our services are worth this much. So we underpriced, and for a very long time we couldn't understand, but we're doing such a good job, why are we not making money out of this thing? So I made the classical woman uh, mistake of being afraid to, to, to price because I thought that they wouldn't give us uh, the business. Now I know, now I call the shots, I tell them that, look, you know my worth, if you want my services, this is what it's gonna cost. But it took me a very long time to get here. And for me, I think this is a message specifically for women that I have seen a lot of that women, are, you know, they, they're very, very afraid to charge. And what I've learned is that the market is willing to pay what you tell it you are worth. It's a very important lesson. And we have to tell them that we are worth it because they will always undervalue us uh, as whether you are a black entrepreneur or whether you are a woman uh, uh, entrepreneur. Um, and people ask, but why the boldness? Why would you do stuff that is so hard? Uh, why would you do stuff that doesn't seem uh, so lucrative? Why would you do stuff that Actually, nobody wants to do because investing in small business is not the sexiest of things, by the way. Like, it's not up there as that's what I want to spend my life doing. People want to do big transactions. Any transactor will tell you that they want on their CV to say, I've done a 1 billion rand, 2 billion rand transaction. They don't want to say, I did a 5 million rand or 1 million rand transaction. It's not exciting uh, when you're a financial services professional, but we chose that. Um, and I think when you have a vision, you know, sometimes you see things and people can't see them. It's called a vision, right? And everybody thinks you're crazy. Um, but when you can see it and you believe in it, uh, there's, a, there's a, an old American called, um, his surname is Carnegie, I can't remember his first name now. Hmm? Andrew Carnegie, who says, if your mind can, can conceive and believe it, uh, you can achieve it. Uh, and of course, in the Bible, you've got the, the book of Habakkuk that talks about uh, understanding the problem. Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what, what the Bible says, but essentially identifying the problem and coming up with a vision and sticking to it. Uh, that is the best way. So, so that's another thing I've learned, that the best way uh, that you can achieve or, or you can almost guarantee succeed, um, su success in your life is when you, as I said, you understand the problem but you actually can visualize the solution. You can see what 
it looks like on the other end. You know, nobody else can see it. When, when we started our business, I used to say to, to my team, and I still say it, I say to them, I see the JP Morgan of SME uh, finance across the continent. And, and anybody who understands that, in a space that is not the most exciting of spaces. Now, if you think JP Morgan, you don't think small business. But I see what we do as exactly what JP Morgan offers to your big corporate. But offering it to a market, by the way, that nobody cares for, that nobody wants to serve because it's so difficult, that is underserved. But guess what? We've had identified that this is gold that is waiting for somebody to mine and uh, unlock the value. So next time I talk to you, ask me how the JP Morgan uh, is, is doing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, with all this boldness and uh, excitement uh, in, in South Africa, and having, I mean, we've done a lot of things. I, I, I'm not going to touch on everything that we've done. We've gone into spaces such as, uh, in fact, that's how I met uh, Africa. We also run a tech accelerator where we invest in um, tech startups. Now, Everybody in South Africa assumes that there aren't black tech players in this country. Guess what? I think we're probably 50%, if not more, of the tech startup market in this country as black people. So technology is the new frontier. We're not, we're not getting into old sectors. We're getting into new sectors. But what is said is that, uh, again, as has been our historical experience, black uh, startups do not have access to angel funding, to seed funding. Um, accelerators that exist mainly in Cape Town and mainly the Stellenbosch crew. Um, so the black guys come up with some of the craziest, some of the most exciting ideas that I have seen. And that, that's one of the reasons I go to work, by the way, because I never know what I'm going to see that day, you know. Uh, and we were bold enough to uh, launch a, a tech accelerator. We are still the only black woman owned tech, tech accelerator that I'm aware of in this country. So we're pioneering, we're bold, we are ever evolving, we are ever uh, uh, innovating. Very, very important uh, characteristics in my view for an entrepreneur. If you want to, to remain relevant and stay ahead of the pack, just because you are the best yesterday doesn't mean you're gonna be the best tomorrow. So you have to constantly be challenging yourself and saying, what am I gonna do differently tomorrow? What am I gonna do differently tomorrow? What new product am I gonna bring in? So that when your competition is trying to catch up with you, you've moved on, you are one step ahead. Um, and I suppose it, that makes sense why it is that we would now be bold enough to start operating outside of South Africa. Hey, South Africans are afraid of this continent as if they're not part of it. <laughs> you know, whenever I travel on the continent, uh, uh, my fellow African brothers will be like, ah, oh, you South Africans, uh, you think that you are part of, you know, uh, this, this uh, you know, it's almost like there's South Africa and then there's Africa. So it's like South Africa is a continent on its, of its own. And uh, what I've learned is, we are very fortunate to live in this country. It's a very well-developed uh, country. Like, we've got good, world-class infrastructure. Everything works, okay, except for ESCOM every now and then. But <laughs> pretty much everything works, right? Uh, and so, so, so meaning that we are, we, are, we, are, we are probably a highly industrialized uh, uh, economy, generally. I mean, there are pockets of, you know, of, of challenge. But generally, when you compare us to the rest of, 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 of uh, the, con the, the countries on the African continent, we are, we, are, we are miles ahead. Uh, so it means that opportunities for growth, if you are serious about scaling and growing and making serious wealth, uh, you, you, there are very few of them in South Africa. In South Africa, you'll have security, you know, opportunities are de-risked. We've got so much information, you're able to do a proper due diligence and and end, and your money will be safe, but your returns will be pedestrian. But the beautiful thing about the African continent is that it's the next frontier. Uh, they came, they stole the resources, they did this and that and the other, but they never developed it. Uh, and Africans, more and more Africans are, are educated and are coming back home. So some of the fastest growing cities on the, in the world are found on this continent. So if you're going to be confining yourself to South Africa and saying, I'm a South African, I'm going to wear, wear clubs and, and, and focus on South Africa, then you'll you'll get 10% returns. But if you're serious about creating wealth for future generations, you need to go beyond South Africa. I think there's great opportunity beyond the borders of this country. And I think if we, said, if we establish great collaborations and relationships with our fellow brothers and sisters on the continent, uh, we will really uh, do exceptionally well. I think there's a lot that we can learn from uh, each other, but I think we can 
really make this continent great, and not just South Africa. We're not Trump and trying to make South Africa great. We're trying to make this continent great because we are of the continent. Uh, it's our continent, and it's time for us to make it great. So that's what inspires me. That's my next uh, toy that I'm going to be playing around with, and I'm looking forward to that. And hopefully, I'll be invited again to share my story about how I found Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We can do let's give her another round of applause. Thank you so much. This is the thank you for a, a profound inspirational lecture or talk. And uh, this is a, an opportunity where people will ask you a lot of tough questions and then you can then respond accordingly. Uh, questions? Questions? Going once, going twice, at the back, you are noted. Oh yeah, I can just... Um, my sister, you are noted to that side. I was just there and I'm trying to get in. My sister, you are noted. Let's take the drain and then hold man. So, boy, I'm a sense of it. Let's do that. Um, that uh, I think there was somebody that side at the back or oh, out. Uh, Rotman or CC or CC. We're taking three, and then uh, you can then respond. I'll take another set of questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, and thanks once again for um, sharing your platform with you again. I'm meeting you for the second time because. Me and my team were part of the first cohort of that I'm in accelerator program you just engaged on. And uh, simply quickly, my Ikamunja Bulo Makatini, and I'm representing Airby. And simply, my question is what would you say are the missing pieces uh, in this entrepreneurship sector? Because also, another thing that is a reality is the whole s ecosystem needs to play together for the improvement of the whole thing. There's the entrepreneur as well as there's the other stakeholders, there's the government, there's legalities that are also part of this big part. What do you think is the missing part in all of this that we need to sort of align? Thank you. Thank you, my brother, uh, my sister. You got, you got the first question. Okay, you did. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Tebiso Makubedu, and I believe I'm one of the greats of tomorrow. Yes. Mapolo, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, my question to you is this. At some point, we all realize, as you said, through somebody standing and telling their story, that we can be anything and everything that we've ever hoped to be. But along the way, we all make mistakes. So my question to you are, what are the five grave mistakes that you have made that have made you five? five. Okay. <laughs> Five. I think let's take two. <laughs> A five in name. Order, <laughs> comrades. Order, order. Order, comrades. Order, 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 comrades. The five grave mistakes that you have made that have made you not be where you wanted to be when you first realized you could be all that you can be. Thank you so much. Five. I think maybe we must divide now two. <laughs> when she comes and talk about Goldman Sachs two. And when she comes and talk about Africa one, isn't it? <laughs> okay, you, you'll answer. My sister, you're the last one. It's a very tough, but stick to two, not five. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Ampolo. I'm Mapule. My question is actually similar to what she had. I was going to ask about the lessons that you've learned uh, from the mistakes that you've made. But the other question I have is relating to imposter syndrome as a woman. How have you managed that and how do you deal with it still today, especially walking into rooms or boardrooms that are perhaps made up of men? And how do you navigate the biases that are in the room? Imposter syndrome. I suspect I understand it, but I'm not very confident that I understand the question. So wh what is an imposter? Who would be the imposter? Would um, it be you as the woman? Yes, so okay. I think a, a lot of women um, Perhaps I'm assuming here by thinking that maybe you've suffered from it as well. But I know a lot of us suffer from imposter syndrome where you're afraid to speak up and you're afraid, I think what you were saying earlier about not wanting to charge what you're worth, um, coming from a place of fear, I suppose, and thinking that you're too small to be playing in that room. Powerful stuff, okay. Imposter syndrome. I know there's an imposter one, there's a two. 
There's a tree that is coming now. Let's give us a, you can come and respond. Tree is fine. Do you want okay. me to stand there? No, no, no any, whatever makes oh, you happy. Okay. If you Thank you. Stay, I think fine. it's easier. Yeah. I'm also wearing high heel shoes, so you have to be kind. <laughs> <laughs> the imposter syndrome, you see. <laughs> the things we do to ourselves. Njabulo, <laughs> uh, I remember you very well. Uh, and I actually liked your product. I just never understood why we never funded it. Um, but uh, what is missing in the ecosystem is, the, is all the parts. So what we find is, firstly, there are a lot of, uh, in my view and with all due respect, there are a lot of pretenders in, in the ecosystem. And what I mean by that is people who claim to know when they actually don't know, right? Uh, so we have a lot of service providers in the entrepreneurial development ecosystem in South Africa and everybody claims to be an expert in something or the other. And what then happens, which is one of the biggest tragedies of, of BE, is that then black entrepreneurs spend their lives in training and boot camps and incubators and come out having learned absolutely nothing. And then because they've got this 18 month certificate, they then come to a, a, an investor like me and they say, well, I went through this program, uh, which is supposed to be an investor readiness program and therefore, uh, here's my pitch. And then when I unpack the pitch and I ask you the, uh, the question, so what problem are you trying to solve? You look at me and you're like, ah, oh, well, typical funder, they don't want to give me money, right? Because that program did not help you to actually understand the importance of defining what problem it is that you're trying to solve and how you're going to solve that problem. So, so, so we've got that very real uh, challenge that um, the market is nascent. So it's not a function of, we're not a bunch of sorties. I think it's just the nature of, South Africa started talking very seriously about entrepreneurship around 2007 when we, when we changed the, the, the BE codes. Patrick, uh, I, I see you. I haven't seen Patrick in more than 10 years. <laughs> So thank you. And he used to cover us a lot uh, at the DTI. Um, so we started talking only seriously about entrepreneurship and, and thinking about it. And, and remember, talking about it doesn't mean we have figured it out as well, Jabulone. We're still figuring it out even today. So that is the, the, the problem we face in South Africa is that we've got a very nascent ecosystem. And therefore, although we, we know what the different parts are or should be from a policy perspective, we haven't figured out how to do it well on the ground, because none of us has the experience. I mean, I'm running an accelerator. I've been figuring it out as I've been going along. I've literally gone to the US, copied what they do, went to Israel, copied what they do, came back and told Bono Ngu and them, okay guys, this is what I saw the white guys in Israel doing. This is what I saw the guys in Seattle doing. So, so that's what we're doing right now. We're figuring it out. Unfortunately, it means that there are a lot of casualties uh, along the way. I also think that we, we, we do a lot of, we, we, we talk shop a lot. You know, we, not, maybe talk shop is not the term. We, 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 we talk a lot about what we want to do, but we don't do it. So for instance, I think that, that there isn't enough seed capital in this country uh, for the level of entrepreneurship we want to see. There's still too many guys who have got great ideas who need seed investors. And because we are poor as black people, you don't have enough uh, angel investors. So the question then becomes, our institutions that are providing funding for entrepreneurs, why don't they create seed funding pots? Because that's what we need. Uh, so so it's, it's little things like that. But we, we hopefully we'll figure it out, but we haven't figured it out. I think that's, that's the problem. I feel my answer was too long. So let me move on. Sepiso, your, 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 your question is very, very difficult. The reason why it's difficult is that you're asking me what mistakes have I made that have made me not to be where I want to be or where I think I should be. So I will give you two answers. Ne? The, and the, the, the first answer is the answer that I prefer to give. But the second answer is probably maybe the more honest one. The first answer is I always say that if I had not made every mistake that I have made, um, if I had not had the setbacks that I have had, I would not be half the entrepreneur that I am today. So I'm thankful for that. Because uh, what it does is it makes me an empathetic investor. When you come to me and you tell me your story, and, and you say that you made this mistake, hopefully it's one of the mistakes I've made and I can relate to it. If I've never made it, I might just be very arrogant and say, well, you are clearly not very clever, you know, and move on. You, you understand what I'm saying? So I think that there's, 
there's, it's intangible, but there's much more value in making mistakes than not making mistakes and, and, and being right the first time. And I think if you were to value me today as a person versus five years ago versus 10 years ago, I think I'm worth much more purely based on the very many mistakes that I've made. Um, so that is the answer I prefer. The more honest answer is if I had chosen different partners or walked away from certain partnerships earlier, I would be much further. So the power of association is very, very important. If you're not equally anointed, hey. <laughs> Ah, problems, problems, my sister. So, uh, I was given permission to only uh, give you two responses. So, Mapule, <laughs> lessons learned in business. There are very many. Um, I've, or, I've already alluded to one of them. Um, but I, I, maybe let me answer it by answering the imposter syndrome. So, I think. I'm going to now speak as a mother and as a woman, uh, and I'm speaking to other mothers and other women, but importantly, I'm speaking to the fathers. I was very fortunate, I always say this to people, I was very, very fortunate that my mother, the, the reason why I would say to my mother I'm going to be a, a millionaire is because she always, always used to say to me that anything you want to be my child, you're going to be, right? I wasn't brought up to believe that because I'm a girl, I would do less than a boy. So I've always, it has always been a problem. Because then when I've encountered boys and then you know, they want me to behave in a particular way, I've never been able to do that because I was not socialized that way. I was not socialized to, um, how do I put it? I was not socialized to walk into a room and feel like I don't belong. You know, I was not socialized that way. I, if, if you were, ask Patrick Wadula, uh, he used to cover a lot of the work that we did at the DTI. I was probably one of the toughest people, uh, uh, Patrick, right? Uh, uh, and not because I, I, I wanted to be tough, but I think for me, I wanted to occupy my rightful space. And of course, at the time, I was also very, very young, so maybe I was a little bit too tough. Um, but, but, you know, I think maybe I was compensating for other things, but I think uh, I try not, to, and I'm very conscious of what you're talking about, by the way. So whenever I walk into a room, I always make sure that even if I'm in my depressed mode, because we all go through those modes where you're feeling down, you know, not, you're not feeling so great. When I walk into a room, I stand up straight. I'm, I'm very deliberate about it. So that uh, there's nobody who thinks that, you know, I, I, I am apologetic for being there. But I think for me, the biggest thing has been being taught. And I'm not saying that I, I come from a perfect family, that I still have a lot of other traditional things that I do, that women do, that we shouldn't do. But I, I'm, I, I, the reason why I said I'm speaking as a mother, as a woman, and speaking to men is because I've come to appreciate the importance of the messaging that we receive, the messaging that we give to our children. So if we are the lost generation, so maybe or now we are damaged goods, if, if, if we can go back today to our families and tell our girl children that you're going to be the best, anything that you, you, you put your mind to, you can be. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're better than the boys. It just means you, you, you can equally achieve whatever, because it's, it's a very important uh, subtle message. You're not, you're not saying go out and be arrogant and, and think that you're better. No, you're just saying, if Tabo can do it, so can you uh, do it as well, Mapule, right? Because, you know, uh, uh, I think that is important. Because um, I think that's how we're going to start seeing the rise of women not as more powerful than men, but women stepping into their rightful place, in my view, in society. Mm. Powerful stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's take another set of questions. My brother, you noted, uh, uh, like you are noted, uh, Zenzen, you are noted, my sister, you are noted. Let's take four. In that order, one, two, two, two. Okay, so we are, when we take the last set. We still have time. This is a way I go for this end. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tuanelo. Hi, Pulu. Che. Um, okay. So I'd imagine that the, that the IDF fund has an interesting story in terms of how the fund actually started, especially given the ambition of the fund. So I'd really just like to hear practically 
how you were able to gather institutional investors, etc., or whatever it was, to build the fund. <laughs> um, and another question that I have, personally as someone who's also interested in one day investing in businesses, is how do you solve the issue around um, lucrative investments that sort of give you a peak in revenue and then there will be times when there are troughs. How have you personally navigated the peaks and troughs that come with investing and making great exits, especially also given the social impact that your investments do have? Because Thank you. Oh, oh so no, no, no two, two, two is enough. No, no, okay, yeah, two. Two, 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 two is enough. I'm going to allow you to get two. That's a guy, two. Thank you, my brother. My sister, it's your turn. She's still writing. She's still writing? Okay. 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 Are you done? Um, okay. Hey. Um, thank you very much for the story, and thank you, thank you for setting your path as a black woman, especially in corporate. So my question is, funding is an issue for uh, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs, right? But the more pressing issue for entrepreneur, entrepreneurs is the access to markets. Uh, how do we, the, what advice would you give someone? Because you, you find that an entrepreneur has gotten the funding, but then they realize, okay, it's time to sell their good, goods. They don't have access to that market. What advice can you give to young entrepreneurs in terms of navigating the markets? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. And then uh, Zenzide at the back. Hi, Ma. Uh, thanks for inspiration again. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is that I heard that you started doing uh, only females. Are you now doing everybody? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, uh, yeah, no, we, we just want to we, we, we wanna jump in, but we don't want to get there and jump in. Ganti. No, 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 we still, you know. But two is that what are, what are the most uh, I, I'm sure you've sat down and had uh, plenty of entrepreneurs coming in to see you. What has been the most frustrating uh, that is common with all of them? Uh, you know, what has been the most frustrating thing that you hear from uh, entrepreneurs? I love it. to live my Okay, let's give it to, to her. It's four questions, and then we'll take the last question, then we'll close. Um, okay, thank you. Is this Tuanelo, ne? Or Tuanelo. The story of IDF is very long and funny. Uh, I was telling it to my team last week, actually, and they were laughing at me. Um, but let me try and... So the story of IDF was difficult. Actually, what I didn't tell you is that Sasol was one of the people who said no to me when I went to them <laughs> to ask... Um, <laughs> I went to... <laughs> I went to Sasol to sell them my story of running an ESD fund and how brilliant it was, and they decided that it's not such a great idea. Um, and that was the story that we were getting at the time. So we went to market in 2007. They went, other than the corporate ESD funds, they weren't really private-held ESD funds in the market. So it was a very foreign concept because we had just concluded uh, the codes, which essentially made it possible for companies to, 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 to contribute to ESD funds. So we were having to educate the market, and it took a very long time for the market to, to figure out what it is that we're talking about, because our speaking investor speak to a, to a procurement guy. That's the worst thing you can do. <laughs> They've got no idea what you're talking about. You say, you, you say, I'll give an RR of whatever. They're like, what is that? Just tell me what the points are on the scorecard. You know? so, uh, and and, and we, we, we got it wrong. I mean, I, I blame myself. I, I, I completely misread the, the, my, my customer. I thought my customer was the CFO at Sasol, and it should have been. But I was talking to the procurement guy at Sasol, and he didn't understand what I was talking about. He was just interested in the, in the which, which he should have been, of course, interested in what, so what does it mean on the, on the scorecard. So in, in my messaging, I should have learned to show him what it means on the scorecard, but still had my information pack and talk about IRR. You see, that, that's the mistake that I made. Um, but we eventually went to institutional investors. We went to the IDC, we went to, it was called Kula at the time, now CIFA, and they understood the language you were talking about. So they gave us money, uh, but we, 
Hmm. Took us so long. Uh, we almost closed shop. I've had three incidences where I've almost had to close shop because the thing about fund management is a, it's, a, it's a numbers game. There's a, an optimal size you need to reach. If you don't reach that optimal size, you're, you're, you're just never going to make money. It was taking us forever. So to 20, the first time I went to my business partner at the time and I said, okay, I think in a month we just have to call it quits and let go of the staff members we're not going to make it. Uh, and this is, you know, when, you, uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you start believing in God if you didn't believe in, in God. <laughs> because you start seeing grace. <laughs> grace abound. <laughs> Literally a week after I had said that to my business partner, we got another investor on board, uh, which then meant that our management fee was able to cover our, our costs. Um, and then later on, uh, the, the, the second time I think that I almost uh, lost my business is when, uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, I was now hiring about eight people. So I was starting to start feeling, uh, you know, important and I delegated things I should never have delegated, <laughs> including compliance, because we are highly regulated uh, by the financial services, uh, kind of what do they call them now? Uh, FSC, they used to be FSB, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the authority. So I delegated a responsibility that I should not have delegated, and this is another important lesson. You asked me about lessons. In business, when you're an entrepreneur, don't, don't, don't lose sight of what you need to, 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 to continue to take responsibility for. You can delegate day-to-day -day functions, but Responsibility never delegate. So I almost lost my business because my license lapsed and I didn't realize because I thought somebody else was taking care of it. Um, but the story of, of, of IDF is, is, is very complex and dynamic and it's long. Sorry, it's hard made. So I feel like I need to tell it uh, over a cup of tea or something or when we have time. Uh, but it's a very funny story as well. How do you solve the problem of businesses operating uh, like having d different uh, cycles, you know, this month we're doing well, the other month we're not doing well. Oh, well, um, I, you know, the thing about us is that we are also a little bit of a strange animal, because yeah? your traditional fund management doesn't do what we do. Your traditional fund management are your mainstream private equity venture capital stuff, right? And, and what you do when you are doing that purely is very different to what you do when you do ESD, yeah, fund management. So I do both. So I'm schizophrenic, literally, because when I'm talking to my corporate clients, as I said, the language is different. The, 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 the matrix that I'm being judged on is different. Uh, and when I talk to my institutional investors, your, your IDCs, you know, your international guys, they want IRR. They want to, you know, to know that I'm meeting their hurdle rate and, and things like that. I'm not impairing and, and, and things like that. So it's a very different, you, you have to wear very different hats. But uh, in your traditional, gosh, I feel like I'm giving a lecture. Uh, in your traditional uh, fund management space, the way that you assess uh, investment thesis is whether there's potential for scale. That's typically how your VCs and your PE guys uh, uh, assess. So you, you make a, a certain assumptions about potential for scale and how you are going to help those businesses scale. And you have to understand the sectors and therefore the cycles within those sectors that maybe in, in the first year or two, especially in, uh, let me use technology as a very practical example. Uh, tech startups typically in the first three to four years, you are not seeing any profit. Like you just have to accept that, okay, we're losing money, right? Especially digital technology in particular, not, not hardware and stuff like that. Um, so if you don't understand that as an investor, and then in year three you're starting to have palpitations and heart attacks because you didn't understand the sector that you are, you, <laughs> you know. Uh, but when you, when you are an experienced sector, in the, sorry, uh, investor in the space, then you know that in year one, these are the things I need to do in year two, these are the things I need to do in year three, these are the things I need to do. I'll still not see profit, but I know from year four I reach break even. So it also then informs you around, so do you put in a five-year instrument or do you put in a seven-year instrument so that you can maximize your return? So it's, it's a very, again, technical um, uh, response that, that, that I can, I think I'm going to register adverts and become a lecturer there on <laughs> private equity. But I'm sure you get the gist, ne? And I have a very different conversation when I, I, I'm talking to my ESD guys. There, they just want to know whether the money is coming back. It's typically contract driven. So all I want to know is, is there a contract? Is it solid? Is it for three or five years? Then I fund it. It's a very different conversation. Um, Nolutando, more pressing issues. Oh yeah, so access to markets. So 
So, so Nolutando, if, if you were, to, you'd be very lucky if you get money before you get access to markets. Like that funder would really be crazy. Because what are they funding if you don't have a market? You understand? So to be a very, unless maybe your rich uncle gave you money, which is still also not a good uh, thing because then you're going to waste <laughs> Malume's money, right? You'd rather, you'd rather first sort out the market issue and then go and find the, the, the money to fund it. Um, so, so that's what I would say. But I think the issue of access to markets, it's a, it's a network thing, I, f I think. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think if, uh, so for instance, in this room, there are entrepreneurs, right? Um, the one thing that a lot of entrepreneurs don't do well is to sell themselves when they are in, in environments like this. And, this. and yet, this is actually where you're supposed to be doing your marketing. Everybody who, who lives here today should know what Nolutando does as an entrepreneur, what problems she's trying to solve. They must have her contact details, or she must have the contact details, right? So I think it's it's as simple as that. But you can also do formal things like attend supplier days. Typically, big companies have supplier days where they invite entrepreneurs uh, to come in here about opportunities in the supply chains, especially now within the with, within the space of BE. I don't know whether it was the case in the past, but now with BE, companies are constantly looking for. Uh, finding uh, black uh, suppliers, uh, black women in particular. So I think maybe forming part of those formal networks, but also just general business networks. I mean, um, I, I almost said SACOB, but SACOB is for big business, ne? But okay, the equivalent of SACOB for, for small businesses. So, so just getting yourself into those networks, I think that's a good place to start. And then John, uh, no, I don't do women only. <laughs> I believe in equal opportunity. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we do, we, we are deliberate in targeting women because you have to be. Uh, but uh, we, we, we funded, uh, one of my, uh, one of the entrepreneurs uh, that we funded is there at the back. Uh, and I was worried, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to speak and this guy knows me. So every lie I'm going to tell is going to say, ah, found it out. So Tabo, Dr. Lefoko there is, is one of the entrepreneurs that we've invested in. Um, <laughs> and then what are the most frustrating entrepreneurs? Uh, I can give you a laundry list of what's, what is frustrating, but I, the one thing that I really wish entrepreneurs could learn is to have a, what I call a teachable spirit. Uh, entrepreneurs who don't have a teachable spirit tend to fail. They don't listen. Um, they make very bad mistakes and they fail. Uh, that has been our experience. We actually categorize them. And we say, okay, this one falls in this box. We don't touch them. It doesn't matter how great the idea is. If you fall in that box, we don't touch you. But there are very many other things. Uh, I think the one, the worst, one of the worst outcomes of BEE is that you've got a bunch of black people running around town thinking that they're entitled uh, to opportunities, to money. Um, and as a black person who respects myself and my intelligence, I, I, I'm, I'm seriously challenged by the fact that people would, would uh, I, th I think that they disrespect themselves. Uh, if you're going to go around town having that entitlement uh, mentality, you're, you're, you're undermining your own capability, in my view. You know, you, you, you need to want to be challenged so that you can prove that, in fact, you, 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 there's merit for you to get the opportunities that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take the last set of questions, yeah. uh, if you're allowed, Chair, and then we'll be done. Uh, the big doctor, um, I'm happy that she, she, I want, we wanted also to acknowledge the big doctor that's starting the first black-owned uh, bank. I think maybe we'll expand on that. But Morris, we have the, the big doctor. Uh, he's going he's gonna to ask a question, um, which is good. And um, I think it serves as an inspiration to also to most of us. And then my brother, you are noted. Um, which one again? Oh, Mfundis, yeah, yeah, okay, nah, okay. I think let's take... Let's take do, uh, the big doctor, my brother. Oh, yeah. no, 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 it's very important that we mention which is most entrepreneurs 
by Utla only at the end when uh, the application for funding is declined, which is due diligence. Now, I know you go into details, but I want you to give us just three important factors that we need to uh, be aware of as entrepreneurs that you go going to include as part of your due diligence so that we come prepared when it comes for funding. Thank Powerful. You. Thank you so much. Uh, we're coming from the same townships. We're orange for my son. Okay. Thank you for coming all the way, my brother. My brother there? Hi. Oh. No, no, it's you, my brother. I need to be Mike. I'm going to be You're the man behind the mic, yeah. Uh, my name is Temba. So it usually they call me Stout. But stout. that's a story. Yeah, story for another day. So well, the question... Stout. <laughs> the Temba and Stout. Yeah, no, no, it's a story for another day. Oh, story for another okay. day, okay. Um, my question is, uh, most of small entities, they have little or no track record, and then often deemed uh, risky from a business, from, from a banking perspective. So my question is, how do you price for risk? Because usually when banks, uh, they assess uh, the credit risk, usually they use, they use information to, to price for that. And then secondly, uh, is uh, for, for all the deals that you, you are funding, what are the mitigation strategies that you have in place to ensure the business survives and then you get the returns that you want. Thank you okay. so much. Stout. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is very okay, let's take this. Okay, thank you. I think it's up. And go start. Mandy Bully says, this is Paul, sorry. I think for me, there's two questions. I'm more interested in, in, in what drove you to start your, your business because. I'm just concerned that maybe there's a feature that is prominent in terms of people starting business because they want to make money or they really wanted to solve a problem that they could identify and know or what they can solve. That's one, the first question. Personally, what, what drove you? <coughs> the second question is around you know, the three things that you mentioned, which I think it's a good combination theoretically but I'm not too sure how feasible and how does it impact the one that wants to start. You said we must have passion, you know, we must have resources, and we must have skill. So in order for you to be able to solve the specific problem that you have identified. Now, I'm not too sure if those aren't really hindrances or how do you make sure that that exists and how does it impact those that want to start? Th 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 thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Let's take the last two, so that then we close. Chair, if you allow me. Okay. Uh, let's take the last two. Okay. Doc, and then we'll take one. Is there one pressing question? Is it pressing? Is it pressing? <laughs> if it is pressing, we're going to take it. It is pressing. Okay. Let's take it. And then the doctor will then, you know, close. To those who didn't ask questions, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we are on WhatsApp, uh, we are on all social media platforms. Fundis is still, we are anointing you. We're going to call you Papa today. Okay, Sanwanani, Sawana Mampulu, thank you for sharing your story. And what I'd like to find out is that. Um, what are some of the businesses you funded, or an example of them that you funded, funded through your fund that initially seemed lucrative and promising, but eventually fell uh, well in the negative? What are some of those reasons that related to the entrepreneur not succeeding, and what are some of the reasons that were just purely uh, market factors? Thanks. Thank you. So I wish I wish we can have a, a half a day or a full day. So we can expand more because these are insightful questions. And and okay, there is some there we also have an MMI where we delve deeper. Go deeper, papa. <laughs> <laughs> go deeper, papa. Oh, only on MMI we go deeper. But here we you know sharp hazel. Okay, yes, the last one. Uh, Doc. Um thank you, thank you, sir. 
Actually, for me, it's, it's not really a question, and I, probably that's why I wanted to speak last. Um, it, it's more of a testimony, really. And it's a testimony to that lady over there. Because, um, and I said it in one of my um, LinkedIn, uh, uh, what do you call it, LinkedIn post, where, where I actually did indicate that you came and you talk about concepts and ideas and plans and things, and most people look at you as if you are crazy. Okay, and they don't, they don't support you, but she did. So, so to the extent that she's standing here and talking, and uh, this is not a fairy tale. If you go there and you talk to her and you've got a good, solid business and you can back it up, and you've got a contract to back it up with, you know, um, she, she's funded us. She's funded a business that my wife and I are involved in, possibly because of the wife, not necessarily because of, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but she did. And, and she still is involved in the business. I still have to pay her back, but it's a story for another day. And I'm hoping that in time we should be able to do that. But all I'm saying is that they not just fund you, but they support your business as well. They come up with other things around, you know, to try and either assist in terms of going, uh, you know, getting more out of your business. So, so, like she said, it's not just a traditional fund, uh, you know, they put money there and then they just wait. They also work with you. So, and that to your extent, yes, I'm, I am standing here because I wanted to say I am an example of what she talks about. Amen. 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 So uh, let me let me finish before O Arabadi puts it out. So I think I think um, I'm tempted, but I, I I think it's probably not the right platform. But maybe at some point that uh, we could have another discussion around Tafari Capital. I think at the moment it's her space, so let us let us focus on Thank that. Thank you. Yes. There is an MM. So cut them off uh, as and when they wish. Uh, I want to know whether there's any legal correspondence that talks about litigation and, and, and. So it's a very long, boring list of things, but that are necessary. So I think the easy, I would say the easiest thing is for you to actually ask the funder for the list. They typically wouldn't say no. We, we do give a, a, a due diligence list because it's only fair for you to know what it is that is required of you. Um, but but please, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say due diligence starts from the, the minute we shake a hand. Eh? How you come across is very important in how a, a funder or an investor de determines whether they're going to part with their money or not. And then Tamba Stowd, most SMEs have little or no track record. How do you price for risk? Uh, we have a Sangoma on the side. <laughs> No, it's it's a it's 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 yeah it's a very tricky one because there is information asymmetry. We don't have enough to go around with, so we do what irritates a lot of entrepreneurs, which is we ask them a lot of questions and we spend a lot of time with them, and they don't want to spend time with us because they want to be out there selling, which which the rightfully should be doing, but the the in the SME space you have to be creative around how how you you do risk. So so you, so spending time and and getting to understand the jockey very very important. Um, but also testing. So for instance, if it's somebody who's very early stage, if they've got strong contracts, great. Because then I, I can test the strength of that contract. Then I can test whether you've got the skills to actually execute successfully on that contract. But if it's a pure blue sky, then it's a little bit more, uh, you know, and that's where now we start becoming very creative. You know that people in our space are very creative. Now you start seeing things that don't exist. You start seeing the unicorns. Uh, but again, it's the entrepreneur who gives you the comfort around. Um, for instance, they'll give you projections, and you, you then test the veracity of those assumptions. You know that they're just assumptions and they're just projections, but the level, uh, the, the extent to which the person has, has done their homework, they've prepared, they, 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 are, they are subject matter experts, and then helps you to almost uh, get some level of comfort that this person knows what they are talking about. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a gamble. Let me give you a, a very practical example of a business that I, I'm very, very proud of. Uh, most of you might know it. It's called Sweep South. You know Sweep South? 
Sweep South, I met them in 2014, I think. I was at a, I was at a tech startup thing in Cape Town, and there was this young woman who is, uh, I don't know what is her qualification, Aisha, but she's a, uh, do you remember what Aisha Pando's qualifications are? But she's like one of those, you know, she, she's got qualifications that black people don't have, you know, <laughs> at a PhD level. I can't remember what it is. Um, and she pitched, she, she you know, she, she's a, I'll, I'll remember now, I just cannot remember. She's not a physicist, it's something else. Um, she was talking about an area which is cleaning. She, 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 has, she, she and her husband had developed a, a, a technology around how you aggregate cleaners uh, so that they can meet seekers of cleaning services and then they can get jobs. So if, if you've got a, a, a phone, you, you just go to Sweep South and you download the, 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 the app. Um, and for me, it was like, I never thought you could actually, it's almost like a brokerage of cleaners. Um, I never thought you could find a te technology solution to, to something like that. And, but she had done so much research. She had, done, she had put in so much of her own money and resources in testing this thing. So by the time the pitch was over, I was like, I don't understand it, but I want in. Uh, and when we did the transaction in 2014, because we only concluded early 2015, the, that business was valued at about a million rand. When they did their last round of funding some, sometime last year, they were valued at 75 million rand. Um, so, so, so you get those, but then you, go, you get the other ones that sound that true, and then you lose all your money. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's, 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 it, that's why you know, sometimes it's a gamble. So we did very well there, but then there are others that we did something similar to, and we, we lost everything. So when you look at it at a portfolio level, hopefully it's still worth your while. That was too long a response as well. Okay, risk mitigation. Okay, and that risk mitigation, what Ndate Lutloko has just described, that's pretty much what we try to do. We do a lot of what we call business support. We don't always get it right, so it's not a perfect model. We are, we are refining it as we go along, but we do try to support our entrepreneurs as much as, as, as possible without uh, babying them because you also don't want them to be too dependent on you. And then, Lihle, what drove you to start your business? Um, I think, firstly, I've always known that I'm, I'm not long-term employable. I don't think any employer would tolerate me for a very long time. I think <laughs> I'd be a very difficult employee to contain because I've got a lot of energy. Um, but uh, I just, I, and this is the honest truth. So, so South Africans, you know how good we are at complaining. Ne? Yeah, government must do this, and Lise must do that, and Sviso must do this, but Pulu uh, never ever sees herself as part of the solution. So I've got a strong philosophy that says if, if, if you're not doing anything about it, you don't have the right to have an opinion about it. So I was coming from having worked at the DTI, having understood what the economic development challenges were, and I could have sat there and said, oh, the DTI should do this, or national judges should do that, and I thought, you know what, Espolo, I think I can do something about it. So that's what drove me, uh, to be honest. Uh, and it continues to drive me today, because a lot of the stuff that we do, everybody says it can't be done. And I'm like, okay, well, she's is another one that I have to go and do because nobody else is going to do. Um, and then passion, resources, skill, um, uh, being the requirements for success. I do believe so, but the mistake you shouldn't make is, I'm not saying you should contain all of them in yourself. So I know you can be the passion guy. Ne? You, you can be the passion guy and the visionary. But then you need to go and find the guy who knows how to, you know, if, if, if they're going to bottle water. Go to the guy who's a water expert and knows how to water, uh, bottle water. Don't try and figure that out because maybe that doesn't excite you. You know, your, your passion is, maybe your passion is I'm trying to solve the water problem, but you're not passionate about, <laughs> you know, putting the water in the bottles and, and bottling it. Do you understand? Your passion is solving the, 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 the problem in, in the Northwest. The, the biggest problem we have now is shortage of water. So maybe if you're from the Northwest, you're passionate about solving uh, uh, the water problem, but you're not trying to figure out how to make this bottle and, 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 and stuff like that. So, so, so that's what I mean. You need all of them, but don't make the mistake of thinking that you have to own, you know, own all the, the skills yourself. And then Kululeko, example of businesses that seemed lucrative, what led to the failure? Uh, so the example of uh, Sweep South that I've just given, who is Nkululeko this side? Uh, is, is, is an example of being really very lucky uh, right, so so we, we took a gamble and we're very very lucky, but there were 
10 other sweep souths who did not give us that exponential growth. And sometimes people just got drunk. Sometimes people know how to, uh, they talk about sales, what? Uh, salesmen who can sell snake oil to something, something, you know? Sometimes you, you come across people who actually sell you stuff that really does not exist, but then they're so good at it that you believe them. Um, you know, they, 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 they are there. Yo, there's a story of a guy. Oh my gosh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that story. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's so funny. So this guy, um, I, so he had been uh, working with my team for quite a, a long time and, and he had come up with this novel way of helping one of our clients on how to push more sales in the market. So, so one of our clients is Telcom and one of their biggest things is they want to support entrepreneurs who can push more airtime sales and things. Brilliant idea, right? Brilliant idea. Um, and uh, so I don't always get involved at every stage of, 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 of the investment. So when my team is not sure about a person's characteristic, because remember I said that for us, the, the personality and the whatever is important. So in one of the last meetings, we are ready to go sign. They say, okay, come and meet this guy. And I listen to his story. And then I'm like, but that is not possible, you know? You know? <laughs> Something just said to me that is, it's, it just doesn't sound true, you know? And I can't say to him, you're lying. But luckily, I happen to know some people, because, you know, when he told me where he's from, I'm like, oh, do you know so-and-so? He's like, yeah. Got on the phone after the meeting. I'm like, dude, do you know this guy? Ari, stay away from that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, um, and then we went, and we had done a, a due diligence on this guy as well. So you, you couldn't pick up anything on the credit um, on the credit assessment and stuff. Look, I think maybe they were still going to do the criminal checks. I'm not sure. But I, the, at the time, they had not done the criminal checks. So after I heard his story, I'm, so this guy had been in jail, I don't know how many times. Uh, but he had such an amazing story. And Telcom was ready to give him this business. And we had to... So, so anyway, we did further investigations and found very, very damning things. And we had to go to, 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 to Telcom and say, sorry, we can't find it. It's your money, but we're not going to give it to a crew. You know, and we're not very popular, but uh, you know, sometimes you come across uh, those guys. But, but this guy, I think he was so smooth that he had literally jumped most of the hurdles that he would have had to jump through a screening. And it was just, again, as I said, when you're an entrepreneur, you start seeing God. Because by the grace of God, I was invited to that meeting. <laughs> and there was just something that he said that just, it, I, I, just I was like, it's, it's just not probable. Yeah. You know, it's, I couldn't uh, see it. Tabo, I think you know this guy. I will tell you the story properly. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's it, eh? I think I've covered everything. Have I covered everything? I think so. Let's have your yeah, closing you. remarks. Yeah. Uh, is anything missing? Yeah. Uh, just closing oh, remarks. Oh, okay. okay. All right, great. Closing. Thank you. Jeez, I don't have closing remarks. I feel like I've spoken so much. But, um, but I hope that uh, in my story you could see yourselves. And I'm hoping that in this story you are inspired. So next time I come here, these three young gentlemen will be telling us their story. Right? Uh, but I really appreciate the generosity of your time. I think you've been very, very generous with your time. And uh, I do this because I think it is important. Uh, and we need to uh, t tell more and more of our stories so that um, we can create more and more of them. By telling them, we create more and more of them. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Powerful stuff. We can do better than that. We can do better than that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Siabonga, Realeboha. Much appreciated for taking time just to come and talk to us and challenge us and inspire us. Um, is it the announcement? Okay. Should I call Daphne? All right. How's Daphne Itla? We, uh, it's a commercial break. She's here to to, to sell us, uh, and the funder the funder she's here. Yeah, I think I was Stephanie Matsoho. You know, I get half thing I was Stephanie Matsoho. I feel as if it's a TV show. Oh, pull up, pull up, yeah. 
Harsha pele ngwa noba tu matzoho. Okay, you only have five minutes, uh, according to to the chair, uh, the CEO of ULP. Your time starts now. Hi, Bazalani. Legai. Kite. I'm just so grateful to have this opportunity. I know I have a few minutes, and um, at the same time, I don't know whether Abut Morris knows I'm a preacher as well. So, <laughs> so you might be here until 12 midnight. But I'm just here to share a little bit about this book that I published on Amazon on the 1st of December. And then um, now we've got printed copies as well in South Africa. So the reason I wrote this book, uh, I'm going to try to be very brief, but I must say that um, everything that Sis Polo said, uh, it's, you know, it's captured in this book. And it's because what she said, she was sharing, you know, success principles. And in order for me to be able to write these principles, I had to make a research, I had to, you know, also study, and I had to also look at my own experience. Um, I studied education initially, and then I realized, no, I'm not a teacher because they finish at two o'clock, and I still have more energy to continue going. And then I realized that, no, let me go study something in business management, and then uh, I realized as I was doing that, that I have such a passion for business. And by the time that I was doing my third year in business management, I was referred by my, my lecturers to another businesswoman. I'm sure some of you might know the name, Anita Sony. She passed on, I think, last year or so. And she asked me to be her business partner. And that was my journey in you know, running a business. And I realized that you know, it's something that you've got to have a passion for. You cannot do it if you don't have a passion because there will be so many things that will challenge you along the way. So, um, you know, I'm here to say to you that if you want to go into business, know exactly what you want to do and know that there will be challenges, but that doesn't mean that you must stop. I know we've had this so many times that, you know, never, never give up, you know, continue until you have your breakthrough. But I think also uh, it's very important for us to understand, especially as Christians, that you're not going to just get your success by just praying and just having, you know, that mind, that dream that I want to have this. But you're going to have to take a step of faith and venture into whatever you want to do because it takes action you know, in order for you to see success. So I usually say that uh, without execution, you know, then you're not going anywhere. Execution is what matters. Your action is what matters. It's very important to understand that it's not enough to have a dream and just sit there, or it's not enough to have a dream that doesn't correlate with what you do during the day. Because what happens is that some people they have a dream at night, and then when they go, you know, along the day, they forget that dream on the pillow, and then they get to back to that dream when they go back home. So I just want to encourage you that, you know, take your dream with you. Don't leave it on the pillow. Take it with you and, you know, do action steps according to the dream that you want to achieve. And I also share so many principles in here and I know because of lack of time, I won't be able to, you know, even do even, you know, 5% of it. But I realize that most people is because we think there's extraordinary people. We don't understand that they are ordinary people who take extraordinary, you know, steps to achieve great things. I realize also that uh, unless you and learn certain things that are not helping you, you will not go forward. So it's very important for us to learn the right things and also to unlearn that which we were taught when we were still small. Maybe, you know, you were taught that 
only white people you know, can be successful or only white people can be wealthy. Or you were taught that because of the previous you know, apartheid regime, you cannot be successful. But that's just a lie because you know, what you tell yourself is what you will be. If you cannot see it, then you cannot become it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So this book is, is available. And I'll leave this copy for you and Sis Joyce. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Our uh, Stephanie. This is the book here of Def of, uh, our Stephanie. It's a hard copy of today's message. I think that's what she's saying. She's saying she she had a foresight before you spoke and uh, your your story is captured here. If you don't need a DVD, you need a hard copy. Here's the book. It's called Climbing the Ladder of Success. Hey, Bafuetu. Usi Supume Nagu CEO Magazine, Top uh, Top Women in Business, SA Government Magazines, as well as Oprah, uh, Winfrey uh, Magazine. When Upume go pee. Sorry, man. This is a first session, sorry. But you see, Puma Gumakazina. Thank you so much. Bob Morris, it's your turn. Uh, just to come and give us a vote of thanks. But once again, as Polo, much appreciated. I hope they would invite you to uh, go MMI. If um, there's an MMI, MMI is the wing of ULP. I get here, we just strike an emotional chord, you know, just to inspire you. But the MMI, we then unpack the principles, you know, the methodologies, the next practices, what to do. We do that in detail. I think that's called uh, Atlo Regisa. Was a salesman. He was reading about Kono Mashaya. I hope uh, this is a man. San Bonan. Are we good? How was the session? It was awesome. Hey, eh? Great stuff. So, um, MMI Marketplace Ministry Institute, uh, we present to you this year our first dialogue. Uh, which we call it Thrive, and our sister Penuk Survivor, and Let's Thrive in 2019. And how we're going to do this, it's, it's through a dialogue uh, where we can talk more about some of the stuff that was discussed today. So there's a lot of drivers that drive our economy, but if we don't know what those drivers are, and there are people that know these things, that participate and do research around these things. So uh, we're calling you in MMI to come and join us on the... 23rd, which is next week, Saturday, right here at ULP. It's free, or oh, not free, it's subsidized, fully subsidized. Uh, somebody's paying for the, the bill. So it's fully subsidized. You can go to our website, which is mmi-sa.com forward slash dialogue, and then you can register yourself there. We're meeting here. We're going to uh, have a few hours uh, where we go through uh, a few topics. We've got about great speakers. We've got about three uh, businesswomen. That will be joining us, and we've got our four other, uh, uh, three other uh, 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 businessmen that are joining us. So it will be head to head, and you'll be hearing it from both sides in terms of the opportunities that are there. How can you participate in them and all that? So, and we have uh, Israel Mkiza who will be coordinating and driving the session for us on the 23 of February. So, apart from that, MMI, we open for 2019. Our class starts on the 9th of March. And you can register online. It's open. It's still open. We still have a few seats available. And it's only costing you 7650 for a nine-year program, for nine, nine month program, nine, not nine years. <laughs> nine month program. And then you can come join us, and your life will never be the same. Enjoy. Why are we talking about uh, unleashing leadership? Is because we want to unleash that leash that was leashing you here. Now it's leashing you in the head. 
So that's why we use the word unleash. So that you, you are released. If you start asking the same problem, I say, but why are African leaders not accelerating? You're again robbing yourself because you're asking a question from the platform of a victim, assuming things happen to us rather than us being able to make things happen. The more you know about yourself, the more also you know that the, these are the kind of people that I need to bring as part of my team. People who are maybe slightly different or maybe people who share the same values as you. I would have said that what we have attained in South Africa is the potential to become a unique civilization. But it can also rise and fall depending on what we do as this elite assembled here and as society broadly. In life, you will have to deal with failure. If you can't deal with failure, you won't succeed. Nobody that is successful never failed. For me, I just want to share with you that hard work really, really pays. Don't expect that you will progress by just asking. Do it. Work hard and uh, the rewards will come. Have a vision of what you want to achieve. Believe absolutely in that goal. Don't let anyone take you off that path here. Go for that goal. Be brave enough to take mentors or people on that road as may be necessary and work hard and accept that it is not a one-day match. The lesson that I got from there was integrity. That integrity, integrity, integrity. You build it over 50 years, it takes 50 seconds to lose it. Protect it. Protect it. I'd like to isolate three characteristics that I wish and pray you will demonstrate in your leadership capacity, in your leadership roles. Because if you do, then South Africa is going to be a fantastic place to live in. And these are ethics, commitment, and courage. Leadership makes and break a country. Leadership makes or break a community. Leadership makes or break a company. Leadership makes or break an organization. Leadership makes or break churches. Leadership makes or break any religious organization. Leadership makes and break our families. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, before I say my thanks to Sis Pulo, I also want to advertise another book. Uh, I, we, in, in ULP, we promote black writers. Uh, our stories need to be told. Lise, not this one. <laughs> uh, leadership nuggets for the emerging leaders. Lise, stand up, man. Let's give him a round of applause. He's, he's, he's been a committed ULP member. You see, he's got a lot of nuggets now he can share with you. Uh, 2018, you saw, this was last year, and uh, uh, 2019 is promising to be a great uh, uh, also year. Uh, on the 7th of March, we've got Ndade uh, Mohale, we all know Bonang, great leader of our country. He's written a book, Lift As You Rise, which is the ethos of uh, uh, ULP, I asked him to come and he says, I'll be there, my brother. So he'll be also coming with his books. Uh, that book, uh, to, uh, he'll be marketing it here, but he'll be talking about what is uh, the story there. So please uh, make sure you diarize that. Uh, he'll be here. The next one, we've got uh, Mr. Andy Lesangu, is uh, currently uh, the CEO of uh, Anglo America South Africa, is the head of uh, Anglo-America, South Africa. He's doing a great work uh, in terms of scenario planning 
in Zulamiti uh, scenario planning. In other words, projecting uh, in the future of our nation uh, going forward, and he's done a great work there. And I've asked him to come and share with us uh, uh, about uh, the scenarios that we may either go a low road or high road as a nation, and uh, so that we get out of the morass that we are in. And then the, in May, we've got Uputi Sizwe Masane. You all know he was uh, running the uh, FNB group, First Rent, and a great man and an uh, unbelievable man. And uh, he's also um, told me he's keen to come to ELP, and he's currently uh, busy with uh, school, uh, establishing a school, uh, private school program. And uh, he's very passionate about fourth uh, industrial revolution, making sure that we teach our kids uh, that they can survive in that. So there are those dates. Uh, we'll tell you the next one. Huh? Oh, yes. Yeah, Trevor also is a great uh, post-election. He says, no, I don't want to come before elections. <laughs> and uh, Trevor is coming uh, uh, in June, so he'll be able to unpack for us uh, the... Uh, the elections at that time and give us a sense of uh, where the country is going. Uh, I hope all of you have registered. Have you? Yes. Hey, make sure. Uh, have you checked? It's easy to check, by the way, whether you're registered. It's about valid anyway. Uh, but uh, just make sure that we all participate in a democratic process of our nation. Am I finished? Yeah, great. I think it gives me pleasure to really. Malusa, in Dalon. Also, come back born, man. He's an entrepreneur, you know. Wins us some bags, uh, which are beautiful. Look how beautiful. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> this, is, this is. Can you come and, and this is Polo. This is your gift uh, from uh, Malusi. Uh, uh, and it's made. When are they? What time is it? Ha 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 ha. Come, 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 come. Yeah, it's a beautiful one. Let's, yeah? No, 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 no. Stand here. Who puts the pilots? The pilots are come. Come and take a picture. Uh, yeah, you see, we've got entrepreneurs here. Uh, whenever you've got something, come and say it here. Yeah. As you said, it's just like here. Yeah, Every no, entrepreneur everywhere. must, must, must use the opportunity. Yeah. Now yeah. we know there's in Dalo. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Thank you. Let's give him a round. We've come to the end of our session. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, make sure you've met at least two or three people, network, and make sure that uh, you've got uh, new friends and make sure that your business uh, is succeed. God bless you. I think, I think Unleash, before, before we go, to I, allow I someone the, or something the, the to be free when they were previously strictly had. controlled. We advise you to register. I know that it's, uh, Leadership, you know, part of the, the ability to establish a clear vision and share that vision with others so that they will follow willingly. Potential, latent qualities or abilities that may be developed and lead to future success or usefulness. ULP. And I see some of Vision, the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination.